And we're live. Welcome back, everyone, to a new episode of the Wheelie Podcast. I'm your host, Micah Toll, and I'm joined again by Electrex Seth Weintraub. How's it going, Seth? I'm good. Awesome. So we have got a pile of new stories here this week. A lot of interesting things to cover. We've got uh, some defective e-bike recalls. We've got a bunch of new e-bikes. Companies like uh, Rivian are toying with the idea. We've got new e-bikes launched by Specialized and Trek. Uh, we've done some reviews on some cool affordable mid drives. Uh, let's see what else. Uh, Razor has relaunched their iconic sort of like 2000s era scooter as an electric scooter for adults. And then we've got a few uh, four wheelers. So we've got the Renault Twizy update. We've got a really cool little quadricycle thing called the Moke coming to the US. And we're going to finish it up with a uh, weird Alibaba post, which is sort of a cult classic among a, uh, a few select readers. So let's see where we're going to start it off this week, Seth. All right. Well, let's get the uh, bad news over with first. So we're going to start with after defective uh, Fido uh, X e-bike recalled for breaking in half. Now another model is doing it. Yeah, so unfortunately, you can see why this was one of the most read uh, e-bike posts of the last week or two. I guess if it bleeds, it leads. Fortunately, no one was bleeding due to this, but this is the second model of e-bike that Fido has created that apparently tends to break in half. So the first one was about six months ago. We learned that the Fido X had this uh, little problem with the folding mechanism that would uh, tend to cause it to become two separate pieces of bike. And, you know, they did a really good job of responding to that. They immediately recalled, they redid the design, they sent out bikes to everyone who had an original one, or they replaced it with a different model. And then unfortunately, it seems to happen again, this time in the Fido T1, which is basically like a Rad Runner-esque bike. You know, when it first came out, I think that was our, our summary was that this thing looks like a Rad Runner. And uh, unfortunately, the step-through design probably wasn't put through enough testing because it tends to break right at the bottom there where you would probably, you know, look at the design and say that seems like a, a weak point. And so <laughs> we had um, uh, someone send in pictures of their bike that they said they were going like eight miles an hour, you know, not very fast. And the bike just sort of crumbled beneath them and they sort of, you know, ran it out. So they stayed on their feet. And uh, then we got a, another picture sent in from someone who said that they uh, saw that they inspected their frame. They found a crack right there. And uh, as soon as Fido heard about this again, they actually handled it really well. So they sent something out to everybody saying like, you know, stop riding your bikes. We're recalling this and we're going to take care of it. So they've already released a, um, an image of the update to the design. They're going to reinforce the bike tube there. I'm guessing what happened is they just used too narrow of a tube because you know, we see step through bikes all the time and they don't always break in half. So they're uh, reinforcing the tube. Uh, and then they're also going to add another few updates. They're going to add hydraulic brakes. And I guess another three thing, a few things that they're going to, you know, throw at people to make them feel a little bit better about being without a bike for a few months. And then uh, the last thing that they're adding, we just learned about this. I'm going to have to update the post is that on the new V2 version of this bike that they're going to send everyone, there's a $10,000 guarantee. So if the new one breaks in half, they'll give you $10,000. So, you know, maybe uh, try to hit some jumps extra hard <laughs> on that one. Yeah. So uh, obviously this is not a good look for a company to have a second bike uh, breaking in half. Um, yeah. I mean, they, they do seem to be handling it well, but like, where was the design? Where was the, you know, the, the testing? Did you have a weight on the, uh, the guy who broke it in half was was he a big fella? He didn't say how much he weighs, but he said he's a light rider. So you know, it doesn't seem like it was overloaded. And then also the guy who uh, said he saw a crack in his frame there, same thing. He said he was a light rider, so it doesn't appear to be a load thing. Huh. Um, and he said the bike had never been ridden off road either. So it seems like it's just you know like many many cycles of just stressing that aluminum there with just normal type of riding without being overweighted. Now the, the original one, the broken half, the guy does take his kids on it. So there's some added weight there. And he said, fortunately the kids weren't on it when he was, uh, when it fell apart yeah, under him, but he sure. said the next ride they would have. So, you know, that's kind of a scary thing to think about. Yeah. It's, and it's kind of strange cause it does look like a larger, um, you know, pole there, uh, pipe, um, I wonder if it's, you know, like, I wonder what, uh, 
what the breakpoint is there, like what what's causing that. I mean, obviously, it's got two uh, pipes above it and two pipes below it, so that's definitely where it's going to break. Um, but yeah, I don't know, like uh, stress testing, I guess not enough. Yeah. And I mean, every bike is going to have a weak spot, you know, like there's, you know, weaker and stronger parts, but ideally the weak spot is strong enough. And in this case, I guess they just didn't run enough testing cycles on it. Um, you know, these, these frame testing machines where they load them up and they just do it like accelerated life, uh, lifespan testing. And so unfortunately it was riders that ended up finding where the weak spot was. Right. And we should also mention, uh, I believe what Antier had a, uh, uh, battery recall. I, I know I did a review of that bike like, I don't know, four or five years ago, and I can't imagine many <laughs> anti-years are lasting four or five years, sadly. But um, uh, yeah, if you have an anti-year bike from four or five years ago, uh, check check for a recall as well. Yeah, these things are unfortunate, but uh, I guess with you know so many millions and millions of e-bikes out there, eventually there are going to be a few problems. Yep. All right. Moving on. Uh, this is kind of venturing into the uh, car side of the site, but uh, Rivian doubles down on electric bikes. Uh, CEO uh, RJ Scarin says company super excited about e-bikes. Yeah. So if you know Rivian, then you know them as an electric truck or an electric SUV maker. And in fact, they were the first to market with an electric truck. But what's really interesting is that they um, have discussed in the past this sort of concept of working on a Rivian e-bike. They filed uh, trademarks or they expanded the, the use of the Rivian trademark to cover electric bikes. And they've even uh, hired away some electric bike, um, you know, high, uh, higher up, uh, I think specialized. They got their CTO um, from their electric bike uh, turbo line. And so they're, they're definitely, yeah. you know, sort of circling around this, this e-bike concept. But this is the most uh, you know concrete example we've gotten so far from uh, straight from the horse's mouth here with RJ saying that not only is the company super excited, but he's given sort of uh, real world use cases where he says, you know, we, we focused a lot on these delivery vans, right? We've got a partnership with Amazon, um, but it's not just big deliveries that we're looking at. We also know that for urban deliveries, there are a lot of small packages. There are a lot of smaller vehicles like e-bikes and quadricycles that are starting to make these deliveries. And he says that this is absolutely an area that Rivian is exploring and it could impact their uh, product portfolio in the future. Now, he was choosing his words very carefully. So he's not saying, you know, we're absolutely right now working on it. He's not saying that like in the Skunk Works department, there are prototypes or anything. But it's, it's not hard to imagine that with them hiring um, and in fact, sort of poaching a lot of e-bike talent and talking about the concept and trademarking e-bike things that... They're absolutely considering it, and there may even be Rivian prototype e-bikes rolling around in a warehouse somewhere. So it's it's exciting to see. Uh, it's interesting because in the comment section, there were a lot of people that were like, "Why don't they just focus on getting more trucks and SUVs out?" But, you know, uh, as a line holder, I'm I'm actually a little bit in that group. Um, but I can add to uh, this. You know, I w I'm not allowed to write it down or anything, but I have spoken to Rivian employees who did like acknowledge that they are working on e-bikes um, and they were actually like, Hey, did you check, you know, the LinkedIn of uh, you know, the specialized CTO and like, Hey, you know, there's a lot of clues out there like our patents and stuff like that. So um, they, they definitely know like there is a bike thing happening. I don't know, you know, these things can always, you know, in a, in an economic downturn or they have to, you know, shrink things or whatever cut cut programs it could always disappear but i believe that they're going to release an e-bike and i believe it's probably going to be their next product because you know they, they're talking about smaller vehicles um that's a that's a big thing um and you know it, it's a an expensive thing and i think right now the company kind of needs more um you know output and getting e-bikes out and you know especially with the rivian premium uh, you know, at five or ten thousand dollars each, I think could really help their bottom line. It could, you know, kind of get their name out there a little bit more, and um, you know, they, they could sell accessories like the Rivian. You know, it's interesting um, when when I did a Rivian review, uh, a couple of my friends in town who work for um, you know fashion and lifestyle brands were like, "Oh my God, can you put me in touch with the Rivian? I want to, you know, see if they'll carry our stuff in their store." 
it's really like a uh, kind of a fashion statement at this point. Um, and, you know, Rivian's super hot. Like some of my neighbors are like, you know, can you get me up, move me up the line? So um, <laughs> it's, it's really cool. And, and if I could, I would, I would move myself up the line, but I can't. So <laughs> priorities. Yeah, exactly. Uh, if I have, a, if I have a vehicle, then I'll, I'll work on you guys, but right now it's me. <laughs> So speaking of specialized and, uh, you know, more urban bikes here, uh, specialized unveils its first low cost electric bicycle model under the globe line. Yeah. So this is, I mean, we talked about sort of like rad runner esque bikes, and this is specialized attempt to go towards that utility crowd. And like, I, I hate that I always compare things to the rad runner, but it really started sort of this utility craze, sure. especially on the, the lower end in the more affordable value bikes. So that's sort of what we're looking at. And that's the idea of what Specialized is doing is that they've uh, created this, this new globe line specifically to target more value oriented customers. Because if you think of Specialized, you know, I mean, just like a, a non-electric bike is already expensive, but their uh, electric bikes start at like three and a half thousand dollars and go up quickly from there. So the goal of this line is really to, to target those more value shoppers and to enter into a more utility sort of um, uh, market here. And that's what the Globe does. It's very much a uh, sort of short tail cargo bike. You know, it's not a big, long uh, rad wagon. It's not like a Yuba bike or anything like that. It's a smaller bike. It could fit into an apartment. You could probably fit it into an elevator too, but it's got the rear rack. It's got a higher weight capacity. It's got those fatter tires so you can load it down. Um, it's got a decently large battery. Um, and it's also one of specialized first hub motor bikes. I think, you know, a few years ago they had another hub motor bike when they were just getting into electric bikes, but it's sort of a, a move back towards these more affordable motors as opposed to their, you know, much more refined, much higher, much higher engineered uh, mid-drive motors. And so uh, this is, this is very interesting because it's just like a totally new market for specialized. It's a chance for a company that has a lot of design chops to come in and really compete with some of these direct to consumer brands like the Rad Powers, like the Himaways, Aventon, Electric, all these other brands that are really, you know, like cleaning up the, the value market. And it's a chance for specialized to really come in and say, like, you know, we can take this serious engineering that we already have. We could take, you know, our Swiss design center and we can build something that is affordable to the common man instead of the like Sunday rider on his super expensive e-bike. Yeah. And, and still like super well designed, like, uh, you know, this looks like a, you know, high end kind of European design uh, bike, uh, particularly the, the tires. Like I love the idea of a smooth tire for the street surface, but then on the sides, you have like the, you know, the, the more rugged, you know, off-road stuff. So you're getting a very low rolling resistance on, on roads and then it can go off-road as well. I don't know if you can see that from, from here, but um, it just looks like a, a really well-designed vehicle, almost like, I don't want to say a cake bike, but it's got like, <clears throat> it feels like there's like a little bit of a cake influence there. And I do yeah. notice it does say, uh, it does have the specialized logo on the front. So it's not entirely not specialized. It's not, you know, entirely separate group, but, um, you know, it, this form factor and, and, you know, I guess we have to give some credit to super 73 and, and juiced and, um, you know, electric for bringing the price down and, uh, obviously rad runner for, you know, making a utility bike. Um, you know, all the ones that came before it, it, it's kind of like those are what I see on the streets now. Like I see tons of those kind of bikes more than I see like, you know, few, you know, mountain bikes that specialized may have, you know, been better at before. So um, it's, this is an interesting trend to, to watch. Um, did, did we say how much this was going to cost? Unfortunately, we don't have that information yet. So right, I took your... some guesses in there and uh, if, if we could keep it with like a two in the front, I think that would be great. You know, I could see this being, you know, twenty eight ninety nine, twenty nine ninety nine. I, I hope it doesn't go into the three thousands though. With the specialized logo on the front, you could see it happening. But I think yeah. in order for it to be a success, it's got to be somewhere in the two thousands because that's that's really the market they're aiming for. And if it's if it's too much more than that, then I'm not sure they're going to be able to convince enough people to to buy a, uh, you know, hub motor non-suspension bike just because it's got, 
you know, some higher end parts and it's got the specialized logo on it. I agree. Um, and then th is this, do we know if it's class two, class three? I mean, specialized is usually one or three, right? Yeah. So it doesn't appear to have a throttle on it, but there is a wire going up to the handlebars that I can't tell what it goes to um, on the right side there. And yeah. so I'm not sure if it's like a brake cutoff or if it's actually for like a button throttle. So if, if there's no throttle, then it'll probably end up being class one, but it would be cool if they gave us a throttle because for utility, especially even just getting rolling when you've got, right. you know, like a kid back there or heavy load, a throttle is just, just so nice for that. Absolutely. Um, yeah, that you're right about the price. I think, I think it, you know, maybe they have a base model with a smaller battery and without all the fancy stuff for 1999, 99 or something. And then, you know, the, the, all the, all the trimmings probably up in the twos and maybe even the threes, I think if I had to guess, um, but you know, why, why create the globe line if you're not going to cut some, cut some money off the, uh, Thing. And also, like the hub motor is going to be a big savings there. Which, yeah, exactly. Do Fingers we know what, crossed here. <laughs> do we know what the hub motor is? It looks like a you know 750 typical. Yeah, it's it's chunky looking. So I'd imagine either 750 peak or perhaps even continuous. Though I'm guessing it's probably like 750 peak, maybe 500 watt continuous. Okay. Well, it's a solid solid looking uh, situation here. Definitely want to try that out. When when is this going to be available? We don't yet have exact figures, I believe. So we're still waiting. There's, you know, a, a lot of unknowns, including that price. Well, maybe, maybe for the holidays or something. All right. Speaking of uh, expensive bike store brands, <laughs> uh, Trek says its new ultra lightweight road e-bike looks and feels like a non-electric bike. Yeah. So this is the new Trek Domain Plus SLR, and it's really, you know. Uh, I mean, if you take a look at it, it looks like a non-electric bike. It's got a bit of a chunkier down tube, but part of that is that it's a carbon fiber frame. And so, you know, it's going to have a bit of a, a wider diameter there. And in fact, this has Trek's nicest uh, carbon frame because they have several different levels. And, um, you know, a lot of people think, oh, carbon fiber, like it's super expensive, but you can, you know, cheap out with like some, uh, some lower quality carbon fiber. So this is their nicest uh, fiber frame. This is also the first time they've ever put it on their e-bikes. In the past, it's been reserved just for their pedal bikes. So, um, you know, they really went to town on this one and uh, it's it makes a super lightweight bike. So it's, I think, 29 and a half pounds, wow. something like that, 11 something kilos. So, yeah, I mean, there are a lot of, you know, non-electric mountain bikes and stuff that weigh more than that. Now, this is a road bike. And so, you know, if, if you're a road biker, then you'll probably think, oh, 29 pounds, that's heavy. But remember that this has an electric motor in it. It's got, I believe, a 360 watt hour battery, and it's got a lot of nice components. It is expensive. Uh, there are a couple versions of it. One has uh, SRAM uh, parts in the gear train, and the other has uh, Shimano's nicer parts. So the price is going to range somewhere between 9000 to about $13,000, which... Um, if you can uh, hear uh, Seth's shock, you'll see that uh, this is well outside the range that we're used to seeing for e-bikes. But again, this is like Trek's top, top of the line electric road bike here. Uh, if they want to send me one to review, I'm, I'm open <laughs> to it. But uh, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm in my world, uh, e-bikes cost, you know, four figures, not five figures. So anything going up over that is just like in the car range. Uh, but like what, what you get here is pretty impressive. Um, do we have specifics? Like we know 300 watt output. Do we know what uh, motor, what kind of battery, that kind of stuff? Yeah. So um, the motor, I believe it's from a company that I'm not super familiar with. It is a German made motor, but it's called uh, TQ or mm. I think the, the company is called the TQ group. And so um, it's, I imagine it's got to be pretty good because it's not like the Germans are going to build a crap motor. Like they just right. don't know how to do that. Right. So uh, I imagine it's it's pretty nice quality. I'm not sure, you know, why not go with one of the more well-known German brands like Broza or Bosch, but perhaps they had more freedom there. I think Bosch is a very like, you know, walled city sort of situation. Sure. So um, that, that could have been the reasoning there. Maybe it gave them more freedom to go with the battery, that sort of thing. 
um, as opposed to being locked into the the Bosch system. But uh, it should also be, you know, a very high quality motor. And you can imagine on a bike at this price, they're not going to put, you know, some no name uh, Asian made motor. They're going to go with like, you know, the best that Europe has to offer. Right. And it it probably, they specialize, not to confuse the brands, but they specialize in low weight, high performance uh, motors. So, you know, theoretically, this is going to be the lightest motor that can put out 300 watts in the smallest so that it, it you know, it's hidden well. Um, and then battery wise, do we know what, what a 360 watt hour battery? Yeah, it's a 360. And then they also have an auxiliary battery. So a lot yeah. of these road bikes will have like a water bottle shaped battery that you can stick on there. And then that gives you another about 50% more battery. And so you can get about 50% more range that way. And of course, range varies considerably on these bikes depending on you know terrain rider weight and you know how much uh, effort you're putting in but a lot of these companies will quote like massive ranges like 60 70 80 miles in the lowest power mode if you're like really trucking on that thing yourself right and and these are super efficient bikes as well so absolutely um, you can get really good mileage cool well i mean there's definitely a market for that i've seen quite expensive bikes out there so um, on the other end of the spectrum from expensive bikes, uh, we have the electric X premium, uh, the most affordable quality mid drive electric bike that money can buy. Yeah. And so I had to put a qualifier here. We have tested more affordable mid drive e-bikes than this. This one is 1899 bucks. So I think the cheapest one we ever saw was like 1600, but it was like a very bargain basement. So of the mid drives that are like decent enough that I would like, you know, put my mom on it kind of thing. I would say that this is the the most affordable bike that is still quality enough to, you know, feel good about it. And so this is, I mean, really the value here is incredible. If you look at what you're getting, not only is it a mid-drive uh, truck run 500 watt motor with about 800 peak watts, but you've got so many other things going on here. There's a torque sensor, there are hydraulic disc brakes, there are two batteries, each one's 500 watt hours, so you get a thousand watt hours. There's a hydraulic suspension fork. Um, there's built-in lighting, uh, included rack, included full metal fenders. And so there's just like a lot going on here. Now, the, the biggest downside I could find in the whole bike is just that it's quite heavy. It's like 75 pounds. To be honest, it feels heavier than 75 pounds. So I kind of want to go find a bathroom scale and, and verify that because it's a, it's a chunky bike. But Big boy. Yeah. Other than that, I would say that, you know, there's just a, not a lot to, to ding the bike on it's you know got a basic level derailleur it'd be nice if the derailleur was a little bit nicer considering it's a mid-drive bike and it's going to get a lot of use um and then the only other thing was that the tires they're four inches wide and it's like a little fat for the city um you know you can take it off road with those which is nice but um i think the the electric xp 2.0 went to three inch tires and that was a nice compromise in my opinion so like Hmm. you know maybe a little narrower tires maybe a little nicer derailleur but Otherwise, like it's just so much value here for for 1900 bucks to get all of that, especially when you compare it to a lot of hub motor bikes out there that have mechanical brakes and cost this much and, you know, half the battery. It's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, I'm looking at this thing and I'm I'm, I love every bit of it. Um, But, you know, my quabbles, I guess the cable management looks a little bit loose and I'm always curious like if I can put somebody on the back and this has a um, I would say not a super strong looking um, uh, rear rack. What do we know what the weight rating on that is? Like, could I put a kid back there? I don't recall off the top of my head. I think you could put like a child seat back there, but I wouldn't recommend like a, you know, teenager or adult. I imagine it could do it, but they would probably say like, you know, definitely don't for liability reasons. It's not one of those you know, adult carrying racks for sure. Yeah. I feel like they could have gotten a bigger rack, uh, pretty easily. You know, it's not going to add that much weight. It's not going to, I mean, to an already heavy bike. Um, how is the front suspension? That's the other thing I was curious about. It's actually quite good. So it's not like a cheapo spring fork, like you might've expected. Mm -hmm. Um, they put a hydraulic oil fork on there and they actually told me that, um, not to toot my own horn, but it was after my original electric XP 1.0 review. 
that that was one of the things that I, that I said that like, you know, that one didn't have a suspension fork. And I think my comment was that like, if they had put a suspension fork on, then they probably would have gone with one of those cheap forks to keep the price down. And so, you know, I'm glad they didn't do that. And so when they went with suspension on the 2.0, told me they did it after reading that and they put a good oil fork on. And so then here too, they kept that, uh, you know, better quality uh, suspension fork. Now it's not like, you know, a really high end, you're not going to go like, you know, downhill mountain biking, but for speed bumps and potholes and that kind of thing, it actually works pretty well. Hmm. Um, so if you're going to take a battery out, are you going to take out the one in the front or the one on the back? Well, the, the cool thing is that they drain equally. So you could go either way. Um, and if you're going to be lifting it up, probably I recommend taking both of them out, but mm -hmm. it doesn't really matter since they've got uh, a battery equalizer there. Some of them, you either need both of them in there or they drain like one at a time. So if you take one out, then you could have like a, a misbalance there, but, mm -hmm. um, because they, they drain together, it's basically like two parallel batteries. You can take either one out, you know, they're both lockable. They're both removable. Which one's easier though? Uh, the, the, probably the rear one, like if you're just going to take one out because right. the front one, you'd be left with that sort of odd hole in the frame. It'd be nice if they had like a, a plug or something so that you don't right. have like a, you know, gaping void there to catch rainwater or something. Right. And I guess like if you were just going on short trips, maybe you only take the, the front one with you. Yeah, exactly. You could save probably like seven, eight pounds that way too. What's what motor is that? It's called Truck Run. It's oh, right. um, one of these, you know, Asian motors. Mm -hmm. uh, the, f the first edition of them uh, was a bit loud. I, I had one on my uh, Priority Current that the downside was it was a little bit loud, but these have improved over the years. And this one's actually quite nice. It's And it's got a built-in torque sensor too. So it, it pedals very nicely. Nice. And what? how many speeds is the gears? It looks a little bit small. Yeah, I think it's a, a seven speed. Uh, it doesn't have a huge chain ring there. Mm -hmm. So when you get up to 28 miles an hour, you are pedaling, you know, fairly fast with your feet. They could have gone with a bit bigger of a chain ring, I think. Cool. Uh, I mean, it looks like a, a fun bike uh, and it's a class three, obviously. So you can go pretty speedy. Um, yeah, for sure. Yeah. The only thing I would add to this thing is a stronger uh, back. I feel like that would be like being able to, take passengers and a foldable bike is the ultimate dream of that little situation. Yeah. Share the fun. Yep. All right. Uh, moving around a little bit, uh, we have razor launching its ankle smashing iconic two thousands kick scooter as a low cost electric scooter. Right. You remember those scooters, right? With the tiny little like hard polyurethane wheels and somehow they would always come around and hit you in the ankle. So uh, they've basically rehashed that scooter. It's called the Razor Icon now. And it really looks pretty true to form to those original scooters. The biggest difference, I would say, is that they've got much bigger wheels now. I think the originals were four-inch wheels. So these are eight-and-a-half-inch wheels. And they actually have uh, true rubber tires. They're airless, which on the one hand is nice because you can't get a flat tire, just like an original Razor scooter. On the other hand, it's a bit of a harder ride, I would imagine. Yeah, I don't see any uh, suspension there either. It looks exactly. looks like a real hard ride. <laughs> yeah, um, probably not as bad as an original four-inch razor wheel, but still, this is not going to be a a plush ride uh, by any stretch of the imagination. But otherwise, I mean, it's like a pretty you know standard adult electric scooter. It does, I want to say, eighteen miles an hour. Um, it's got a, a rear stomp brake and uh, motor braking it's got a throttle up there on the handlebars built in led lighting and i think it's priced at if i'm not mistaken 5.99 it's either 5.99 or 6.99 um so it's pretty affordable you know it's not one of these like really expensive or like you know special edition razor scooter thing where they charge twice as much so you know like 600 bucks is uh pretty decent for a, a scooter that gets you around at like 18 miles an hour yeah, and it's got that like old school look. You you mentioned the uh, braking. Uh, does it just do like a regen braking uh, on the back initially, and then if you want to go hardcore, you you kick it down? Yeah, uh, I'm not sure if it actually regens some of these scooters. They they have like what they call motor braking, where it just sort of like shorts the motor 
right. and it doesn't actually send power back into the battery, but it, it accomplishes the same thing that regen breaking wood mm -hmm. just burns it off as heat basically. Um, and it's sort of a cheaper way to do it because you don't have to have a more sophisticated controller that can actually charge the battery. So I, I don't know which way it does it, but it definitely has, you know, motor braking of some form. That's interesting. And then um, I see a little bit of a light on here. Is that a light down there? Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, when you're scooting down the neighborhood at night, you want to make sure that uh, Karen and her gigantic SUV sees you coming. Exactly. Well, that's good. Uh, is there a rear light? Probably not, right? Uh, I don't think there is. Yeah, you get. Uh, put it. Yeah, you gotta strap it to your ankle. I think. Well, that's definitely cool. Um, Five forty nine is the uh, the Kickstarter price. So uh, if you pick up one now. And when are they coming out? Are they going to be out for the holidays? So um, they're actually available now. They they originally launched a 549 on oh, Kickstarter okay. like six months ago. And now they finally got them um, out into retail stores. So I think it's uh, Target, if I'm not mistaken, is one of the, the stores. You can actually go and like buy one now and not wait on a Kickstarter. But you don't get that uh, you know extra Kickstarter savings for having you know trusted them in the beginning. So you got to spend that extra 50 bucks. Yeah, why wouldn't you trust Razor? They've been around and they're huge. Uh, yeah, in interesting. That's a cool uh, product. I'm, you know, I'm sort of tempted by something like this, but uh, yeah, you know, like the ride's not going to be great. Um, it's more like a fun, showy around town thing. Yeah, take to the Google campus. Right. Um, so somewhere where there's smooth roads. Um, so next up, we have the Renault Twizy electric fun mobile is going to be succeeded by this new electric quadricycle. Yeah, so if anyone's familiar with Mobilize, it's like a new mobility uh, sort of sub-brand from Renault, the French automaker. And they originally produced the Twizy. Now they've launched what is called the Mobilize Duo. And it's basically like an update to the Twizy that adds a few of the things that people wanted for a while. Um, but But it's mostly like a Twizy with, like a new paint job, I would say. There are nicer seats. You get some actual seat padding versus the harder seats that were in the Twizy, but it's still, you know, basically a uh, electric quadricycle. In Europe, these fit into, uh, there's two categories, L6E and L7E, and basically they're somewhere between motorcycles and cars. And so that means that they don't have to fulfill all the safety regulations of full cars but they're obviously going to be a lot more affordable because of that, because they don't have to have, you know, crumple zones and airbags and all that kind of stuff. So you get this smaller, nimble, um, I think it's somewhere around like 50-ish uh, miles an hour or so. So, you know, good for the city, that sort of thing. And, and two seats. So you sit in there tandem style with one person in front of the other. Um, and with the new mobile, uh, mobilized duo, you get those few extra things I mentioned. There's also better doors now. The Twizy had... Um, either like, you know, minimalist doors or, or half door options. And now with the mobilized duo, you get these full doors that are going to be a little bit more car like. So you get a, you know, a nicer if it's raining or if it's, um, you know, cold out, you put on a heater or that kind of thing to make it a little more of a creature comfort car situation while still being able to sort of meander around the uh, car and full motor vehicle laws. I can't imagine we're going to see this in the US anytime soon. It's uh, a tricky regulatory environment for uh, vehicles that go over 25 miles an hour, but are not full cars in the US. We don't have the L7E category that Europe has, which allows you to get these faster quadricycles and still have them be street legal. So unfortunately, I don't think the, uh, the US is going to see this. But for those in Europe, this is going to be a pretty neat update to the Twizy. And uh, you know, if we ever get a chance to play with this thing, Renault, let us know because we'd love to, uh, you know, fly around Paris or somewhere else on this. Yeah, for sure. And I wonder, like, I know this has been answered, but like, I wonder how these things corner. I, you know, they go fifty miles per hour. They do seem a little narrow, but um, you know, they kind of look a little bit like a, a smart car at this point. So, yeah, and I, I gotta imagine with the battery really low in there, right. that probably helps as well. But. Um, yeah, I guess we'll have to try it out to know, won't we? <laughs> yep. All right. Speaking of four-wheel devices that go 50 miles per hour, we have the Moke International returns to the U.S. with a street-legal 
50 mile per hour open top electric vehicle. Yeah, this is very exciting because, you know, we just talked about how you don't get a lot of these sort of weird, not car, but sort of car like electric vehicles in the US. But Moke International, which is a uh, UK based brand, is finally bringing their Mokes to the US. Now, uh, if you're not familiar with like brief history, Moke was like a British sort of military esque vehicle that was originally created in the early 60s and then became popular in beach communities across like uh, the French coast and eventually expanded into many markets, Asia, uh, even the US, they were exported to with a model called the uh, Californian. And so uh, they became very popular, about 50,000 produced over the years, but they haven't been in the US since I want to say the late 70s or early 80s. And so Moke International, the UK company, is the uh, the only company that technically has the rights to produce these. They own the trademark. There are other Mokes out there that uh, are being produced without the trademark, and there's all these legal battles about it. Um, but Moke International is bringing the first actual street legal, um, like public road capable and actually trademarked Mokes to the US now. Um, and I know these are sort of near and dear to Seth's heart because I think it was in, where were you in Macau that you got to uh, play with these in the past? Yeah, Macau. I, I was actually looking for the photo of, of when I was in a moke uh, last, I, which was... I think it's at the bottom of this post if oh, you scroll nice. down. Oh, God. A little surprise there. Yep, that's me. Happy <laughs> mokes. Uh, Macau. Uh I think that's probably circa 2000, so like 20 years ago. Um, yeah, they're, they're, they're tons of fun. They're not uh, super, you know, like safe or I don't even know if that one had seat belts. <laughs> it was like a left-handed uh, or I guess right-hand drive, uh, left-handed stick that, you know, like three speed, not, not terribly good for anything. But uh, <laughs> on the flat roads of Macau, it was tons of fun. Um, wow. Anyway, yeah, uh, <laughs> these are going to be much easier to drive too now because electric, like not only right. do you have to like not drive with the wrong hand depending right. on where you live, but, uh, also there's not going to be any gear shifting because it's, you know, a automatic in the sense that it's a one speed. Yeah. I, I really loved, uh, you know, the, the experience because you're low to the ground, you're kind of in a, a Jeep or a dune buggy kind of vehicle, but not really. And, you know, for, certainly fine for streets, not super aerodynamic, but, um, you know, a fun vehicle for sure. Um, but there is one like super major downside to this, and that's uh, late breaking news. Uh, the prices of these are going to be <clears throat> $42,000 each, which, yeah, kind of just doesn't kind of ruins the whole party. Yeah, right. Like, I, I can't imagine who's going to buy that. Like, the, the people who do, like, the the prop collection for music videos, maybe. But, like, I don't know who else is going to spend right. $42,000 on this. Yeah, I mean, you can buy a, a Jeep for $42,000. Like, a real, like, full-size <clears throat> Jeep. I wonder, like, I wonder what the price, like, where the money is going for that. Because... You know, these are very minimalist vehicles. They don't, this one doesn't have like a super high speed or super long range. So the batteries and the motors can't cost a lot. I mean, you know, the seats. <laughs> I, don't, I just like where where's the 42,000 going in this picture here? Like, I, I, I'm sorry. I just don't quite understand. Yeah, I think they're produced in England, so it could be, you know, like higher wages, paying, you know, like insurance. So they have like national health insurance, right? What does an employer have to pay? Yeah, it's uh, something, but still, like, I, I just don't get it. Um, I, obviously, they're not planning on selling a lot of these, so maybe, you know, they're bespoke and they have to put each one together by hand or something. Um but, you know, you would kind of imagine like, hey, if you wanted to make this like a $10,000 vehicle with, you know, these like very small cheap tires and very, you know, minimalist design everywhere, like that would be a better model and sell a ton of these. But I guess maybe they're like, let's go after the high end first. And, and you know, I'm looking at the speedometer and I don't, it said 50 miles per hour is the high end. So you're looking at like the very... I guess you would be able to go up to here. 
Uh, so, yeah. Yeah, they kind of overspect that speedometer, huh? It's funny, I didn't even notice that until you pointed it out. Well, maybe, you know, you live in a hilly area. <laughs> <laughs> Something like that. All right, uh, moving on, we have the weird Alibaba. Uh, this Chinese electric car looks like a beautiful 19th Roadster. This is one of the more elegant uh, Alibaba vehicles I've ever written about. Uh, the awesomely weird Alibaba electric vehicle of the week is sort of this fun tongue-in-cheek column that we write where we collect all these weird Alibaba electric vehicles and we just talk about how like you know each one is unique and fun in its own way. And this one is just like a perfect, beautiful 20s-ish era roadster. So you know it's got those like giant fender cowls, it's got the wire wheels. Uh, it's got that huge grill, like 30 headlights spread across the front of the thing, the big old flat uh, windshield hood ornament. Like this thing just looks the part. I mean, it looks like um, Scrooge McD McDuck should be driving this thing down the street. Uh, it's even has four doors. So it's, you know, got like the nice upholstery. You can carry people back there. Cute little like convertible top thing. Like I just, I can't believe how cool this thing looks and the fact that it only costs ten thousand dollars which compared to all these other alibaba things is quite expensive but compared to the Moog? so much yeah exactly compared to the Moog, you can get like five of these things so uh there you go let alone uh you know shipping kind of thing but i mean even just like the detail they put into this for an, an alibaba car like those very nice uh door handles the um that convertible top thing like it all just looks beautiful the only thing that seems like they kind of cheaped out on was that windshield like i feel like they could have gotten a little more elegant there because it's like just two flat sheets of, of yeah. glass up there or plastic yeah. maybe I don't they're know. like we gotta get this out the door bring me <laughs> something from the factory yeah they took it off a golf cart maybe it was just right. just already lying around but... that's interesting this uh this one has a different one it looks a little bit classier yeah right it's uh or they stole that picture from a classier factory's uh <laughs> Uh, yeah, production there's, line there's a couple of them yeah you know maybe they have uh you know new parts or something yeah it's like the early model and the late model there's a little video there of it in action uh at the bottom so we can see that it actually does work thing is it's super slow i think it's like a great soundtrack that they included there they also put the rain filter on the video which doesn't make sense for this type of vehicle Oh, it's supposed to be raining? Either that or a very potato quality camera. Right. Yeah, what a weird thing to do. But yeah, to me, I mean, that is just like the epitome of a beautiful Alibaba car. We've seen weird things before. You know, we've seen like school bus shaped food trucks and electric submarines. And um, I think today's was uh, an electric bike for three riders. But in terms of like artistically designed, elegant sort of like classy vehicles this has to be the top that we've found so far and this one even it was found by um michael bauer our graphics guy like I, i've sent him so many uh weird alibaba vehicles to uh create graphics for that now he's getting like the weird alibaba ad showing up and occasionally he finds some keepers nice yeah it's addictive i, I noticed <laughs> like on some so there's some variants in the uh pictures here so like the one in the box has like lights on the sides too. Like I want the one in the box. Like that one seems <laughs> like a much better uh, product. Even the front grill is totally different. Oh uh, yeah, yeah, you're right. There's yeah, there's definitely different different versions of these. I wonder Look at which those one headlights you though, man. Like they really like they could have cheaped out on the headlights too, putting like you know cheap little golf cart lights, but they really have those nice big chrome looking ones. Like they. They, you know, went to town on this thing and they really invested. I, I like what I'm seeing. Yeah. And you know what this is perfect for? Parade. What? Oh, that, yeah. I would love that. Oh, my gosh. You need this in a parade. Like this is the, like a parade vehicle. And top speed is what? 18 miles per hour? Uh, yeah. That's parade speed. <laughs> I think that's perhaps the only good use for yes. this vehicle. <laughs> right. Exactly. Any chance you could get this uh, plated in the U.S.? No, probably there's no way, right? I doubt it. There are a few states that make it easy to do like um, golf cart conversions. So like you bring in a golf cart, you put a seatbelt on it and they give you a, like a, a state VIN. VIN number. So yeah. uh, maybe I think like 
maybe Colorado is one of them or something. So there might be a couple places you could do it, but you'd have a hard time in most states. Don't don't expect to be able to do it in New York. No. And uh, for those of you out there thinking this could be my next golf cart, uh, is this going to work at all on, on the golf cart? Yeah, like obviously it's going to pull chicks, but is it going to like carry your clubs and go up hills and stuff? Well, I have more experience in putt putt than real golf, but <laughs> right. I'm guessing this is not going to be the most ideal uh, golf cart. Not I, a good uh, use case. Yeah, you'd look super debonair driving across the green, though. Though I don't right. think you're allowed to drive on the green. Again, putt putt here. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think's under this hood? Like, there's, I mean, it's obviously not motor or batteries. Probably like the scariest wiring harness you've ever seen. <laughs> right. Yeah. Just like some structural, like, thin, like under, under, uh, spec, like structural things. And, uh, yeah. well, long, long story short, I'd say if you're listening to the podcast and not watching, make sure you go and either check out the YouTube video or just go type in awesomely weird Alibaba vehicle of the week. And you'll see this thing because a picture is worth a thousand words. And, uh, the, these pictures are beautiful. Yeah. And of course, Bauer did an excellent job as always popping you in there <laughs> all right we do have one question uh and it's a good one snake eyes 4311 says for a new e-bike rider that wants to use it for exercise would you suggest a mid drive or a hub drive hmm well i guess we'll both take a stab at this for me i would say mid drive is definitely going to give a more uh sort of attuned ride so you can you know choose your gears especially if you're in hilly terrain you can uh, you know, pop it into a gear that's going to give you a better cadence and you can ride the bike through your gear train. But the I think the biggest difference, especially for new e-bike riders, is that the price is usually just so different between a good mid-drive and a good hub motor bike. So if you're like coming into the e-bike market now, you might be a bit shocked to look at like, you know, mid-drives from Trek or Specialized or the companies that you'd normally associate with fitness riding compared to, you know, you could get into a hub motor bike for like, uh, I think like $800 is the cheapest electric bike, but really, you know, like $1,300, $1,400 gets you a pretty nice hub motor bike. So if you have the budget for it, you can get a probably a nicer riding budget mid-drive bike. I don't know if I'd go with electric XP premium for fitness because it's super heavy. I mean, that would get your heart rate up But um, for, you know, the, the value question here of if you're just coming into e-bikes and you're trying to decide, you know, do I get a nicer mid drive for fitness or do I stick with like a cheaper hub motor? You can get a good workout on either, but that mid drive is going to give you uh, usually a nicer ride and a, you know, more bike like if you're used to fitness bikes type of ride. Yeah. I tend to agree. What, what is that one uh, Broza motor mid drive that we really liked? Is that the ride one up? Oh, the ride one up prodigy, I believe. Yeah. So if, if I were buying a fitness bike, not fitness e-bike, I would go with something with like a very smooth uh, Broza motor type of bike. And that's, that's a good place to start. Um, my, you know, fitness e-bike is a uh, 19, sorry, 2017 uh, Rally Redux IE, which is a Broza motor. And what I like about that motor is it's a belt drive versus a vinyl gear drive that uh, Bosch and a lot of the others use. Um, and it's so quiet that sometimes I don't, I think that I'm actually doing the work, uh, <laughs> until I look down at the speedometer, I'm going 25 miles per hour and it, you know, I'm slightly uphill and I know that I'm not doing that work. So, um, I think that's like the best, um, just, you know, it, the best kind of experience, um, with a hub drive, even with a good torque sensor on a hub drive, you're You're going to have like a little bit of a delay between when you you know, hit the pedals hard and when you actually get the, the feedback from the motors. So I think a mid drive is probably best if you're, you know, if you're not doing throttle, if you're just doing, um, pedal assist. Um, so, you know, that, that's my recommendation there. Like get a, a smooth, uh, motor, like a Broza, um, get a good, um, you know, I, I would say get a, a class three bike, which goes up to 28 miles per hour, because if you're really huffing and puffing, you're going to blow past 20 miles per hour pretty quickly. And, um, yeah, I think it, what, what is the starting price of the ride one up prodigy? Um, I want to say it's like 23, maybe okay. 23, 99, 24, something like that. 
Yeah, I mean that's a great starting price uh, for kind of a, a high end bike like that. So hopefully, hopefully that's help helpful, Snake Eyes. Uh, we did have a few more comments. Uh, the box was. So we're still talking about the uh, the the fancy car here. The box one <laughs> is a complete car, and then um, Meagle is not happy about waking up at six a.m. in California. Uh, sorry <laughs> about that. It's you know also for Europe and Israel, so we're all over the world. And um, officially goaded, uh, rainbow uh, icon there. Uh, thoughts on the Suron? So Suron is a um, a Chinese, uh, very light. It's called the Light B. I think he's referring to specifically um, uh, electric motorcycle ish thing. Um, but it's got a lot of like heavy duty mountain bike parts instead of. Um, like motorcycle parts um and we've both been on them i think you have one in uh florida right yeah yeah i keep one on my parents property in florida it's a super fun like sort of trail bike thing but you gotta use it responsibly and you know not take it on mountain bike trails and stuff yeah and mountain bikers do not like surrounds that's uh that's that is a fact um <laughs> you want to keep that away from the the bike trails um and you know depending on your local police they're probably not going to appreciate it much either because it's not a motorcycle and it's not a bike. It's somewhere in between. Um, Saran is, they do have a, a heavier duty uh, bike coming out. Is that now? Is that out? It's out in some countries. It's coming to the U S soon, but they won't have the street legal one in the U S yet. They'll only have the off-road one, but there is a street legal version out there. Is your Saran uh, in Florida, a belt drive or a chain? No, it's a chain, but I've uh, been hoping to do a belt drive conversion on it because there is a kit that you can use. I was going to say, um, I would recommend if you're getting a Suron Light B uh, from Luna, probably uh, get the belt drive upgrade because it's, you know, it's a quiet bike, but like that chain is just very loud. And since you're not doing a lot of, you're not doing any gear changes, um, you really, it's kind of like a really good uh, belt experience there. Um, it changes it. You know, I, I rode a belt version of it in LA uh, at the uh, Luna um, headquarters, and it was way smoother than um, when that, uh, one of my friends had one around here. So I would I would go with the belt upgrade, and hopefully, uh, you know, they continue to turn them out, and there's some upgrades, and I think there's a pretty good secondary market for accessories there too. So. Uh, one more thing, Meagle says, how fast is too fast for an e-bike? Does going 40 to 60 mile per hour insane on an e-bike? Is it worth buying a more premium e-bike to get these speeds? So we've had a lot of thoughts on that. Um, you don't want to go 40 to 60 miles per hour on a bike that wasn't built to go 40 or 60 miles per hour. Um, but there are some, I would say like the Suron uh, is kind of built to go 40 miles per hour. Um, there's some bikes from... Uh, Dell fast uh, that, you know, are they built to go that fast? Are they built well enough to go that fast? That's kind of a, a question for, I don't know, the, the authorities. What do you think? <laughs> yeah. I mean, the to me, the only reason to build an electric bicycle that goes 40 to 60 is to get around like regulations. But even then, it's not going to be street legal. So why take the chance of pushing those components and that frame past what they're designed to do? If you're really wanting to go with those speeds, then bite the bullet, get a light electric motorcycle, especially if you're talking about using it on roads, then, you know, you absolutely need to be street legal and just you know, like get your motorcycle license and ride like a small electric motorcycle. Yeah, I would say 40 is like kind of pushing it on a on bike parts. But if you're, you know, if you want to get into the 30s, you know, on occasion, uh, you can pick up a, you know, a Bafang Ultra bike from uh like watt wagons or um a fray cc will go over 30 miles per hour pretty nicely um what are some other like yeah there's a aerial rider they've got some bikes that'll do like 32 33 i think even juiced like the yep. the hyper bikes if you fully unlock them can get in the low 30s and yeah, the low 30s to me is like the sweet spot, even up to like 35. If it's a bike with good components, you know, good brakes, strong frame, that kind of thing. Um, good suspension too, because you can get bucked off a, 
a hardtail bike at 35 miles an hour if you hit like a speed bump or something. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, and I, I agree with you on the 30 miles per hour because, um, you know, around where I live, there's a lot of 30 mile per hour roads. And if you're going 30 or 35 miles per hour, cars don't try to pass you. They're just, you know, you're, you're behaving like a, another vehicle on the road. And I feel like that's a lot safer than, you know, them. If you're going 25 miles per hour, they're going to try to pass you. And it's, you know, if you're going up a hill or whatever, it just becomes dangerous. So um, I kind of feel like being able to go car speed is a nice uh, safety feature rather than a, uh, you know, the other way around. All right. Yeah, absolutely. So that's it for the uh, questions. So, yeah, thank you guys, everyone, for joining us again this week. We'll be back in another two weeks for our fortnightly podcast, and uh, we hope to see you there.